Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, I guess, for watching, for watching my talk. Um, I'm very honored to be giving the keynote for DSTARS. Uh, I don't actually often be asked to, to give a keynote, so that's very cool. My talk is called The Little Things, and it kind of wanders all over the place, but there is a point to it, um, especially for people who are younger game devs or newer game devs or people who are students who are looking to get into game dev this is what my talk is oriented around so i, I hope you enjoy it so first of all i have to say that i'm glad to finally be here sort of um i think i met uh julia who invited me to this in poland in 2019 and she had talked about me coming to Italy and I've never been to Italy. So this was very exciting to me. And I made these great plans where I was going to fly to Germany for some other event. And then I was going to take my touring bicycle because I'm way too into bicycles. I was gonna take my touring bicycle down to Munich and then to Fusen. And then I was going to ride up into Innsbruck and through Austria and then all the way through the Alps and then down the other side of the Alps and then go down to Padua and, uh, and see Italy and, and, and give a talk. And that was supposed to be in 2020, so obviously that didn't work. <laughs> so I am glad that, even though this is only virtual, I'm glad that I can, I can be here giving this talk today for you. So I'm just gonna get right into it. All right, so if you don't know who I am, I'm gonna give you a rundown of this. Uh, some of this is relevant specifically because my talk today is really about my perspective on how the game industry has changed, which is just one person's perspective. But um, it makes me think that the future of game development for most game developers is really in smaller teams and smaller projects and more personal projects that are more meaningful to the people that are making them. So why do I think that? Well, uh, I am currently studio design director at Obsidian in Irvine, California. Uh, I started in the game industry in 1999 at Black Isle Studios. Uh, I started as a web developer. Something I always have to caution people about is when they ask me how to get into the game industry, I don't really know anymore. I don't even know if you need to like get into the industry because again, I feel like a lot of this development happens a little more organically than it used to in the past. Um, but I started as a web developer and I convinced Fergus Urquhart, who is still my boss now, <laughs> over 20 years later, to let me, in addition to doing web work, to be a junior designer on Icewind Dale 1. And that worked out very well because I had a lot of experience with Dungeons and Dragons and the Forgotten Realms, which was the setting for Icewind Dale 1. And then I worked on Icewind Dale 2 as the lead designer. Um, after Black Isle Studios collapsed, I went to work at Midway San Diego. I worked on a console game there, Gauntlet Seven Sorrows, but I left long before it finished. And um, it didn't really appeal to me as much as I was hoping and Midway was kind of in a lot of trouble uh, at the time. So I went to work with a lot of the people I used to work with at Black Isle at Obsidian because it was founded by people from Black Isle. So I've been at Obsidian Entertainment since 2005. Uh, I worked a little bit on Neverwinter Nights 2, so even more party-based Dungeons & Dragons games. And then I went on to direct Fallout New Vegas and Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2. And I am currently developing a small project, uh, not just small by my standards, but it's it's pretty small. It's, I would people, see, people would say it's genuinely small. It's not two people, but it's a small project. And small projects and small teams are really the focus of this talk. Um, working on a small project for myself has been extremely appealing uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, 
yeah, I'm just going to jump right into it. So some perspective on this. And by the way, I apologize because I formatted these slides poorly. So just bear with me. Normally, I animate all this stuff coming in. And it looks really nice. But I, I just kept screwing it up somehow. So, oh, well, I, I think we'll all live through it. So the industry in 1999, uh, 22 years ago, is quite different. Um, actually, wow. So my first day in the industry was actually March 26th. So uh, March 26th of 1999. So it's, it's just been over 22 years. So what did it really look like at that time? Well, there was a pretty sharp delineation between PC development and console development. There wasn't a ton of cross-platform development. Uh, I developed games for the PC. I knew some people at Interplay, which was the parent company of Black Isle Studios, who developed for console. Um, but there wasn't a lot of cross-platform development at that time, not so much. Um, second is that everything was about physical distribution. There was no digital distribution at all. Um, the fact that you had to actually distribute a physical copy of a game in a store uh, had so much more impact than you might expect. Um, the box design was very important, but also the cost of all of the things in the box. Uh, how many CDs or DVDs is it? How thick is the manual? What paper is the manual made of? How much does it weigh? Are we including anything else in the box? Um, are we launching near anything else that might take up shelf space? Because you have to remember, these were usually physical copies that you bought in a physical store, so they had to take up shelf space. So the retailer would be kind of picky about what games they took and in what quantity, and they could return them if they didn't sell. And it informed a lot of the decisions about how what games were greenlit, <laughs> what games made it through development and, and got uh, published. I actually did talk to one producer, Jason Bergman, who was our producer at Bethesda for Fallout New Vegas. Jason Bergman told me a story where he knew of a game that was finished and it went gold. It went to Gold Master and it didn't ship because the publisher calculated that the cost of reproducing the physical materials and distributing them would not be remade. <sighs> so they just didn't release the game. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's that's the way that things could be back in 1999. That's very atypical, but it just goes to show how, how much that informed development at that time. Um, there were small games, but they were usually considered budget games. Um, I don't think usually most of those games were considered to have a lot of artistic merit or experimental gameplay merit. Usually people consider them to be just kind of budget games or, or unfavorably called shovelware. Um, either you were making something that had like a pretty good budget or a big big budget at the time, which you know was millions, maybe 10 million. Um, I'm not sure of all the budgets, but like a few million was pretty typical. But if you had a low budget, generally you were making something that was intentionally kind of a knockoff or, or cheap or quick. Um, there was some experimentation and wild ideas in games because the budgets weren't really that high at the time. Um, you know, again, a few million dollars was fairly typical from my memory. Um, and the dev teams were not particularly diverse at this point in time. Um, everybody pretty much looked like me. I mean, that's not to say there were not any exceptions whatsoever, but there were no women uh, game developer. I didn't work with a uh, female game developer until I think five or six years into my career at all. Um, not a whole lot of people who weren't white. Um, honestly, uh, gay people, transgender people were not very well received in the environments that I that I saw or was in. Um, they weren't that diverse. They weren't that welcoming. I'm not saying it's a lot better now, but it was certainly not good in 1999. So this is a little more abstract around 2010 it just serves as a good a good focus point for me because that, that's when we released fall at new vegas but around 2010 um there are some things that were really starting to change quite significantly in the industry from my perspective again you can probably go look up facts and figures on this but this is just my perspective on it so multi-platform releases did become a lot more common there was a lot more releasing games both on PC and console, either concurrently or within a very short period of each other. 
Uh, during this period, many mid-sized developers either were absorbed into publishers, they were bought out by publishers, or they simply collapsed. There were a lot of devs that just went out of business at this time, or they got bought by EA or Activision or another large company. Um, that also happened with publishers. So there were publishers that either they went out of business and their IPs got bought up by another large publisher, or they simply went out of business. Um, some of this happened a little bit earlier, but it continued through 2010. And large development teams started getting extra large. This might not have been like the really key point, but around this time you started seeing dev teams of over 100, not really that uncommon. Um, dev teams of several hundred people or you know multiple studios working concurrently on a very large game like all over the world that became not common but like a thing that people were doing which certainly was not happening 10 years ago uh, the budgets got a lot higher something i didn't put on this slide but with higher budgets a lot more risk aversion um companies really wanted to invest big for a big payout. They didn't want to do small games. They didn't really usually want to do experimental games. Um, so a lot of those edge ideas and niche ideas, they just didn't happen. I mean, that was one of the reasons why we, we couldn't make a game like Pillars of Eternity with a publisher at this time because publishers just didn't want to do it. Um, even if we said it would make money, they're like, well, make how much money? Make a couple of million for a couple of million spent. That's not what we're interested in. We want to spend, you know, 30 million and then make 80 million or something like that. Um, digital distribution was happening during this time period, but it hadn't quite taken off yet. So I'll show a, I'll show a graph later. I didn't even make the graph. I just stole it from somewhere else, but it'll show how that accelerated over time. But around this time it, it was happening, but it wasn't that dominant. And then dev teams have become a little more welcoming and a little more diverse. I did actually work with some women <laughs> and uh, gay and lesbian and transgender people were more welcome. Queer people in general were just more welcome in, in dev teams. Uh, the progress is not as good as it should have been, but this is where it was. It was better at this point in time. So here we are today. So it's about, it's 11 years in either direction. Um, one of the things that was very striking to me as I was putting this together is realizing that the industry, how much the industry has changed in the last 11 years, to my perspective, um, or from my perspective, is much more dramatic than the prior 11 years. Um, you know, like basically 2010 to 2021 uh, is much more of a significant shift in how games are made and distributed than 1999 to 2010. So, what are we looking at here? Uh, there's not really a sharp delineation between PC and console, and in some cases, even handheld and mobile. Lots of games now get Switch ports. I mean, part of this is that Nintendo is, a, is just a little more permissive, I guess, about people publishing things on Nintendo. Um, it used to be pretty hard, actually, or it seemed like it was from my perspective. Uh, but this is pretty common. Um, PC and console releases being day and date, or very shortly after with handheld and mobile versions, pretty common. Um, something else that I want to mention about that is that middleware has really changed this as well. If you work with Unity, as a lot of uh, newer developers will, or even Unreal, the idea of cross-platform support is integrated into the most common middleware that we use. So there is really sort of an expectation that workflows are set up to do this. Uh, Multi-platform releases and cross-platform support are common. Um, I would say in some cases, gamers also expect it. Uh, if you have multiplayer games, they, they're they like, I should be able to play this, play this cross-platform. I should be able to at least share my saves cross-platform. Um, but here's where it gets interesting because there are still huge publishers and huge dev teams, dev teams that Personally, I can't comprehend even how they function because they're so big. Like the idea of a 400 person dev team, I, I can't imagine it uh, personally. I just, I don't get it. I'm, my brain is not powerful enough. Um, but here's the nice thing is that there are tons. <laughs> I think if I say hundreds, it's not an exaggeration. There are hundreds of small dev teams and there are quite a few small publishers that are, are working together right now. 
um, budgets really are all over the place. So yeah, we have games that have well over $100 million budgets. They're not even MMOs. They're just huge games. Um, but we have games that have $50 million budgets and $30 million budgets and $2 million budgets, sub $1 million budgets. They're all over the place. Um, crowdfunding happened. In 2010, we didn't really have Kickstarter-backed games. In 2012, just a couple of years later, you know, Pillars of Eternity or Project Eternity was being launched on Kickstarter, as were a bunch of other games. So crowdfunding happened. We started seeing other sources of funding for games. Uh, digital distribution now is the norm. I don't, I don't often hear people talk about physical products at all outside of the context of collector's editions. So the idea is now that physical goods are not the norm. If people want the game, they just download the game for the most part. And physical distribution is really for enthusiasts who want a very fancy, very pretty box, and they really want a physical manual, and they want a statue, and they want, they want, they want a pony. They want a bunch of like cool little goodies. Uh, but that dramatically changes how we think about what games can be made, how they can be profitable, how they're distributed. It really does change everything. Um, and dev teams now are kind of more welcoming and sort of more diverse. It's not, again, quite there. We still hear a lot of really bad stories, a lot of very public and nasty stories about crappy things that happen at studios. It's still going on. Uh, progress is being made, but not fast enough. But there we are. It's, it's going at a very slow pace. So what does this all mean for the people that are watching this? So one of the things when I talked to Julia about this is she had mentioned that there would probably be a lot of students watching this and a lot of uh, junior level or associate level devs. And that's why I'm orienting my talk around this idea of really small games and small game teams and why I really think that that's gonna be, if you take all game developers overall, that's gonna be it moving forward. I really feel like small teams making more personalized things for niche audiences that are still quite successful for those audiences that's going to be the way to go it's going to i think that it's going to grow the market of who plays games because people who might not have been catered to 10 years ago or 20 years ago now find that there are games that just simply wouldn't have been made 20 years ago and either mechanically they're just more appealing to them aesthetically they're more appealing to them um, all of that means that many more people, I feel, are going to be able to make small games with small teams. And that doesn't mean that the big teams are going away, but it does mean there's a lot of opportunity for people to, to work this way. So these are all games that came out in the last decade. Kentucky Route Zero, the first episode of it came out in 2011. Um, Gone Home, I think, was 2013. Night in the Woods was 2017. Stardew Valley, 2016. I can't remember Dead Cells. A little more, maybe that was 2018, 2017. Anyway, they all came on the last 10 years and they were all either very small teams or pretty small teams. And um, they all found very cool niche audiences and did very well. And I'm just going to say personally, from my own experiences, there is something cool about working on big games. And actually, actually, I'm going to save that. I'm going to save that for my slide where I talk about big games. But basically, working on small games can be extremely personally satisfying. <laughs> but here's the thing. So digital distribution did something very cool that had a very not cool side effect, which is that the market is very flooded. So I think we all kind of know this, but just, just to put it in numbers, this is per year. So this is not cumulative, obviously, because there's a dip at one point. But this shows every year games coming out on Steam specifically worldwide. So every year, with the exception of 2019, it just keeps going up after 2020, let's see, after 2010, basically, it just keeps going up. And uh, it's very hard for your game to get noticed. So if you're making a new game and you're a small developer, it's very hard to get the press to cover you, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and it's very hard for people to notice your game. If it doesn't go viral through social media and word of mouth, and it somehow doesn't get caught up in Steam or the Epic Game Store's algorithms, it might not get noticed, which is really tragic because there are tons of very cool games out there. There are so many games. Um, it blows my mind, honestly. Like, there are so many games that are very cool and it's just very hard um, 
It's very hard for them to get noticed. So this is the challenge that I think all developers are kind of wrestling with right now is, is how to deal with this. And that's kind of going to be my advice uh, is, is how to deal with this. So there are now small publishers. Um, when we started kickstarting things, when we started kickstarting, I shouldn't say we, like when kickstarting started, <laughs> kickstarting of games started, um, we were like, oh, wow, cool. We got our money. We don't have to deal with the publisher. But the thing is, publishers actually do things. Publishers, <laughs> publishers market your game. Publishers do PR for your games. Publishers help get your games noticed by human beings who might buy your games. And what we found very quickly is like, well, it's very cool that word of mouth spread about Project Eternity, but how do we, how do we actually launch this game? Which is why we partnered with with Paradox, um, because Paradox wasn't funding the game; they were marketing it and distributing it in certain territories, which was really great. Um, publishers do very important work, and I think this is something that's overlooked maybe by newer developers: is that there there is an understanding that publishers fund things kind of. Uh, but that they also do they also do PR and marketing and you really do not want to do that yourself if you have a small team. So small publishers exist to help sometimes fund but also to really promote these games. Um, there are a lot of games that come out without publishers and it's it can be very difficult for them to get traction. There are exceptions. Um, I have friends at Overhype who worked on Battle Brothers and they pretty much went without a publisher and I'm very glad for them. It's an incredible game. It's one of the one of the best games I've played in years. Uh, chances are, if you don't have a publisher, it's gonna be very hard to get noticed. So small publishers exist to fill this very large uh, niche of games that big publishers are not super interested in, um, but that need representation. So small and distributed development, this slide is kind of dumb now in retrospect because we all just were going through COVID and hopefully hopefully this is going to be <laughs> wrapping up sometime soon, but we can do distributed development now. This isn't just work from home. This is all over the world. Um, one of the things that really impressed me about Mordhau, and Mordhau is another game that that pretty much took off just based on word of mouth, which is really impressive and incredible, is that this was a team of people who were largely modders and um, Slovene in origin, but also worked with people all over the world really to get it done. So it was made by a studio that really wasn't a physical studio for a lot of the developers. It was just a workspace online. So we've all gone through this, but this really is like a very viable way to work, not just for a convenience standpoint, but developers all over the world can really work together uh, to make things. So I want to give some advice for, for the road ahead here. Let me check how I'm doing on time. I'm actually doing okay. All right, cool. So this is my advice, again, largely focused at people who are looking at getting into the industry or they are junior or associate people in the industry and where to go ahead. By the way, this is a, um, this is a promotional image for the game Season that's coming out. Obviously very excited about it because beautiful art style and it's about a woman who goes on a bicycle tour and, and takes photographs, which again, would that game have been made 10 years ago? No way, there is no way in hell that any publisher would have made that game. I think it's incredible that this game is being made now. So these are the sorts of games that I'm gonna be talking about, these sort of like, not literally like this, but passion projects that have a very specific aesthetic and point of view um, that are made by a relatively small team. So the first thing that I'm going to say, and don't don't hate on me if you're working for a big studio, but I would caution against going to work for a big studio right away. I don't think it's necessarily bad to work at a big studio. I think that when you are looking at getting into the industry, I am very nervous about junior devs working for a big studio, and I will explain the reasons why. <laughs> Large teams got to rally around a vision. I know this seems kind of obvious, but the side effects of this are not necessarily as obvious. So look at this picture. This is, you know, an illustration of, of building a pyramid. You got like one or two fancy folks up at the top, and then you have hordes and hordes and hordes of people that are doing all the manual labor uh, for it, working on executing that one vision. One of those people pulling, <laughs> that block is not going to go up 
to the foreman of the group and go like, what if this were a cube instead? Do you think it might be neat? What if we put a big blue stripe down the center of it? That could really add a lot. But that's really what working on a big game team is like, is that you have a huge number of people that are all taking vision from a central directive. I'm a director, so whether I'm directing 10 people on my current team or directing 80 people on Fallout New Vegas, it's the same idea as that I have a central vision, but the more people that are on the team, the less input they really have into that process. So these are the drawbacks of this. There's not very much room for personal expression, if there's any room at all. Um, second, you really have limited exposure to the people at the top that are making those decisions. First of all, no one has time, because if you have 100 people on a team and you're the head of the project, you simply don't have time to talk to all those people. Uh, second is um, there may be many layers of management between staff level employees and even a discipline director, a design director, a, a programming director. So you have very little uh, exposure to the people making those decisions. Because of the scale of what's happening, the inefficiency can be really frustrating. When you work on a small team, well, you can be inefficient in your own ways, but at least if you want to change something, there's a lot of flexibility in approaching that and doing that. Um, and lastly, work is often very highly specialized on large teams, so it can feel very repetitive and draining. So in addition to not feeling particularly creatively fulfilling, um, you're going to be doing it for three years straight. Um, you're going to be building props for three years straight, and those props might be cans and boxes and, and boring things. Obviously, we all have to do that stuff. Sometimes we all have to do the boring stuff, but on larger teams, it becomes more specialized and more repetitive and less enjoyable. <clears throat> big projects don't, or big studios and projects don't ensure safety. Oh, I just realized I cut off that last word there. Again, I think some people will go to big studios because they have a sense that big studios and big projects are safer. Um, not really. Uh, big projects also will get canceled. Often associate and junior devs are the people who are most vulnerable to layoffs when projects do get canceled. You can work for years and have nothing to show. I knew some people who worked at exclusively big studios for, I wanna say like six or seven years, three different projects, they all got canceled and because of NDAs, they weren't technically allowed to show anything that they had worked on, which is really scary because if you're trying to find a new job and you say, well, I've worked at these studios for seven years, but I can't show you anything, that's rough. Um, big studios can often have very draconian NDAs, non-disclosure agreements that prevent you from talking about what you worked on. Um, and then finally, big projects can take a serious physical and mental toll. Again, those inefficiencies, the scale of work that's being done, um, you be, the larger the team is, the less personalized everyone's relationships are and the more you become kind of a cog, which can lead to you suffering a lot in the process. Um, I will say that when I worked on Fall at New Vegas, which is the, by far the biggest project I've ever worked on, that was very cool because I saw the billboard for the game I was working on on the 405 North <laughs> freeway in Los Angeles. Uh, friends of mine from high school saw commercials during South Park, the new episode of South Park, where I was in the commercial for Fall at New Vegas. It's crazy. I never would have expected that. Uh, it's not actually that much more satisfying than working on a smaller game. <laughs> because even though that stuff is cool, it's really for me at the end of it is how much do the people who play the game enjoy it? And, you know, now 10, 12 million people have played Fall at New Vegas and a million, maybe million and a half people have played Pillars of Eternity. I don't think the end result is more or less satisfying for one of those. Um, if you find a niche audience that really appreciates your game, I think it's gonna be satisfying either way. Don't get me wrong, it can be really cool to work on a big, big game, but there's a lot of dangers that come with it. So what I would say is don't start at a big studio. <laughs> But after you have a little bit of experience, if you look around and you feel a little more confident about it, consider going to a big studio. I think you should just work on what you're passionate about. I know this is easy for me to say because I've been, I've been doing this for a long time now, but especially given that, given that these marketplaces are so crowded, there is not a super compelling reason to make something in an attempt to sort of 
cynically make something that's just appealing, if that makes sense. So if you have not played Disco Elysium, you should. It's really cool. If you have not read about the development history of Disco Elysium, you also should, because it was made by people who kind of expected that they were going to fail, but they just really wanted to do it. They just really wanted to try to make this game. And it's a very beautiful game. It's a very well-written game. has a lot of cool ideas in it. Very, very wonderful game. There's not a lot... You're going to burn out. Basically, if you work on something for the sake of chasing a trend or making something that you really think people is going to appeal to people, but it doesn't appeal to you, first of all, it's probably going to show in what you make. Second of all, it's probably not probably not going to do that well because it's competing with so many other games that are probably trying to do the same thing. And third, you're going to get really dispirited and dispassionate and get burned out. It's not good. I don't think... God, I screwed up my slide again. There I go. I don't think many people are going to argue with this, but don't be afraid to work remotely. That doesn't mean just working from home, but also working with people who are not in Italy, not maybe even in Europe. Um, they might be on a, in a different hemisphere, but logistically, increasingly, this is not only possible, but this might be one of the best ways to work for certain teams where they share a common vision and enthusiasm for an idea, but they're just physically nowhere near each other. Um, I don't think many people are going to argue with this, but don't be afraid to work remotely. Uh, I think there's a lot of benefits to it, especially for very small teams. Doing okay on time here? All right, just checking. So don't be, don't live to work. Um, I, the first, I want to say like three or four years I was in the game industry, I really lived to work. I didn't, I didn't do anything outside of work other than I would go home and go to bed. I might, I might play games. I'd play tribes and then I would go to bed and then I wake up and I go to work. I would, I literally at one point went over 300 days going to work, even on weekends, even for a vacation, vacation holiday that we had off. And I just, I didn't, I honestly didn't know what to do when I wasn't at work and it was not healthy for me. It did not, I don't think my work was better for it. Um, it's very important that if you want to get into this industry and actually survive in the industry, because if you go to Gama Sutra and read articles about retention in the industry, tons of people drop out before their fifth year in the industry. Uh, it takes a heavy, heavy toll on people psychologically, physically, emotionally. It takes a toll on people's relationships. Don't live to work. Um, don't let, and don't let people work your don't let people work you to death basically um there is life outside of your job <laughs> and spending that time outside of your job doing other things can be very very helpful to you and most importantly it will prevent you from burning out and, and very bad things happening to you very very important related to that is experience things that are not games one of the things that is a little frustrating to me when I see a team of developers who are very passionate and very excited, and they all basically share the exact same references to the exact same games and pieces of media. <laughs> They're all talking about the same movies. They're all talking about the same games. There is some benefit to that because you have a certain shorthand in communicating about things, but it means that your perspective is, is really quite narrow. Um, spending time away from work, doing things that are not making games, <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. And those things should be the things that you're really into. I put gardening up here, but honestly, I'm really bad at gardening. I've tried it. I'm awful. Maybe I'll try again in the future. It's quite discouraging though. But I am, I do like history. I bring, I bring a lot of my um, interest in history to the games that I work on. Um, I also love bicycle touring. I love bicycles and I love bicycle touring. This is a tour I took last October in Oregon. It was wonderful. It was very relaxing. I was extremely stressed at the time. The trip was very, very good for me to take. And it was just a very cool experience. And those things will come into your games in different ways, but it gives you a unique perspective. Your interests are not going to be someone else's. And honestly, it will really help inform your games. So the origin story of, um, of Pikmin was that uh, Shigeru Miyamoto was, um, he was working in his garden and he just had the inspiration for these little creatures, these little Pikmin creatures. 
that's a whole series of very cool games that came out of just a hobby <laughs> working in the garden. That's incredible. And those sorts of points of inspiration will come from seemingly nowhere, but it's all based on these experiences. I do really think still that even if you've gone through a game development course, if you can do modding before developing or even while you're developing, it's very useful. There's a couple of reasons for this. Understanding how games, not just how they're made, but how they are put together in the final form is very useful. You know, if you go through a game dev course, you'll often work on small projects and small scale projects. The number of people contributing relatively limited. The number of assets is relatively limited. When you mod a shipped game, when you mod something, you know, like uh, Fallout 4 or Skyrim or something like that, uh, seeing the scale and scope of all the assets and how they work together and how they don't work together is very, very illuminating. So I sometimes like jumping into files and mods I mean, I've been doing this 20 years just to see how people do things, how they structure dialogues, how they organize files, what their workflow is. Um, keeping the scale and smoke, uh, scale and scope small uh, can help you learn a lot with relatively limited liability because if you screw up a mod, it's not a big deal. You just stop working on the mod. Which goes to my next point, which is that you really should start small. <laughs> this applies to whether you're modding something or you're making a game. Um, start with a small idea and work outward. By the way, this is a problem that is not unique to starting devs, junior devs, associate devs. This is a problem This is a problem that I, I've mostly conquered, mostly, but I still push it. It's a problem that certainly people who've been in the industry 10 years still have, which is their scope gets too big. They start building out that scope. They can't rein it in. And then they're stuck because they've committed to building this thing that is beyond them honestly, and everything suffers. So it is always, always, always better <laughs> to start small, plan thoroughly, plan on building from a solid base, understand that you may have to contract at various stages of development. That is the solid way to go. So if you wanna make a small game, start with a solid, simple core executed well and build out from there. <clears throat> Work with people who are not like you. This goes to the point that I kept going <laughs> every, every point in time. Uh, saying the game industry is a little more welcoming. The game industry is a little more diverse. It's not that diverse. It's getting there. So try to work with people who are not like you, people who don't necessarily look like you, people who don't have your outlook. They don't have your background. They don't have the same lived experience that you do. I am telling you from experience, it is good and helpful to have those people on your team to just tell their experiences and um, ask you about your own experiences. There are things that you, because you lived through them yourself, you don't really understand the significance of them until someone who had a different experience reflects on that and says like, really, that's, that's how you grew up. That's what you, you lived in the country. You, you know, you lived by farms all the time. Um, it's surprising how many things people can bring out in you you didn't understand because simply they just they just had a different life. So if you can at all work with people who are not like you, and there are lots there are lots of different ways to be not like you. It can be a different social background. It can be a different ethnic group. It can be a different country they're from, different religion, different philosophical outlooks. There are many ways to be different, and all of those things can contribute to just broadening your understanding and and making the game better. But here's the important thing is that you actually have to try to find those people. I used to have a very naive sense that, well, if they apply, then we can hire them. But it's not that easy because if you think about your own experiences, think about any experience that you have, no matter what your background is, think about going to a place where whoever it is that you are is not the majority of people there. <laughs> there is some discomfort, there is some trepidation, there is some nervousness about entering a space where you don't look like anybody else or you are not like anybody else that is there or very, very few people that are there. You have to actually reach a handout and look for these people and invite them in because it's, it's just hard. <laughs> it's hard to come into a space where you're not represented 
it just, it's, it's unnerving. And I think, I hope that everyone can relate to this. So it's hard, but try to find the people to work with them to bring that different perspective in. <clears throat> that being said, whoever you are, whatever your background is, who you are and the details about your life will matter and they will go into the game. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. It's good that your life and the details of your experience inform the games that you make. It feels personal. It feels real. There are billions of people on this planet and you'll probably some, find some people who are sympathetic to the experience that you went through. Maybe not, but probably <laughs> there are people out there who will either feel what you have felt or they will appreciate understanding a perspective that they didn't have. And you're, you're going to put some of yourself into the games that you make one way or another, but if you're conscious about it, it's a more fulfilling process, I think. So yeah, build on your experiences. If you are lucky enough to work on a game that does well and you get to work on more games, build on your experiences. Um, I worked on a bunch of isometric party-based fantasy role-playing games, and each one that I worked on allowed me to build on the previous one. Um, I've now worked on a lot of them, and I, I did get burned out in 2018 after shipping Deadfire. Um, so it's good to build on the experiences you have. You don't want to throw all the knowledge you build out the window, but you can also branch out. When I worked on Fallout New Vegas, I was not expecting that I was going to work on a first-person console PC shooter RPG, but that's where I was. And I didn't really have experience working on shooters so I had to I had to learn a lot very fast, and then I had to bring all of my RPG experience into it to try to make it work within that environment. So as you develop your career and your experiences, try to use whatever you've made. Don't just throw it out and work on something completely different, unless you find that the experience is really unfulfilling. But if you enjoy something, see if you can kind of pivot orthogonally, keep building on those, and just watch out. You may reach a point where you've worked on the same thing so many times that you don't feel passionate about it anymore. And that's the point where you're probably not doing great work and you're gonna to start to feel kind of resentful about the position that you found yourself in. Make something that stands out visually. Maybe this is obvious, but again, in a marketplace that is flooded with so many cool, cool, awesome games, if you can make something that stands out visually, that will go a long way. I have heard it said that if you can, if you can make a GIF of it and put it on Twitter, <laughs> and people share it, do that. Um, this is from Genesis Noir, which I believe just came out. Certainly an incredibly stunning game. Um, many more games, obviously Night in the Woods, uh, Disco Elysium have very distinct visual art styles. And um, it goes a long way, it goes a long way. I'm getting a little more into the practical here. I started off with very high-minded stuff and now, now, I'm, now I'm talking about things that are a little more practical. Hopefully they don't come across as cynical. but if you can make something that stands out visually, it will appeal to people. Make something that stands out conceptually. I mean, there are certainly things that you can criticize about Papers, Please, but this idea, this is an incredible idea. The idea of being someone working at border, border crossing, um, checking passports, checking identity, doing all these mechanical things, but then also dealing with the real, the reality of what, what you're doing to the people that are coming through this process and how it impacts your life. This idea in itself is an incredible idea. So you've combined distinctive visuals with a very cool concept. So you've drawn people in with the visuals and then the idea makes people go, wow, this sounds really cool. Lucas Pope did something similar. Lucas Pope made this. Lucas Pope did something similar with The Return of the Obered Inn beautiful art style, and then a very cool murder mystery to solve. That's just that easy. Cool visuals and cool concept. But this kind of goes to the uniqueness and these little things. This is, this is where this comes from. It's all these little things, these details really mean something. So one of the things that I think, this is where it gets kind of more cynical and I apologize, but it's so hard to get attention for your game. <laughs> especially if you're a new dev or a small team. Um, something to understand about the gaming press is that no matter how big it is, there are always more games than they can talk about. They just, they can't do it. Um, you might think that announcing your game is a story, sort of, 
it's a story that will blip because on any given day that you announce your game, there may be 20 other games that are being announced as well. No game journalist has the time to preview thoroughly or even review all the games that are being announced and coming out. So these personal things, these like beautiful visuals, these very cool concepts, these new and intriguing mechanics, and not that everything you put into a game needs to be revolutionary, but you have to understand that people love sharing a good story. <laughs> this, is, this is from the Decameron. This illustration is from the Decameron, which is, well, I mean, I'm talking to Italians, so you know what the Decameron is, but storytelling is so intrinsic to like how we communicate with people. Um, if you can give people a story, like we had big head mode in Pillars of Eternity, that's a story. In, a, in an age where nobody had big head mode, we decided we were gonna have big head mode because I thought it was funny. Um, a journalist made a party of all rangers with bears because it was funny. That's a story to tell. That's a, a thing. Um, the Outer Worlds, you could kill everybody. And that was a story. That was a thing to talk about. So give people something to believe in, something that inspires them, and they'll talk about it and they'll share it. Um, they'll share it organically and the press will probably also run it because they want people to click on their articles. So that's hopefully hopefully the most cynical thing I can say is give people something to latch on to with your game a story. Just having a game that you're making is not really a story. Um, it's Or it's a story of that magnitude. The last thing I really want to say is that you should help each other. <laughs> especially because as junior devs, you will make up the majority of the workforce that is making games. This will always be true. So some things that I mean by help each other. First, share your techniques and your design philosophy freely with each other. If you have a way of doing something, like a technical way of doing something, a way of approaching something, talk about it with other people. Share your ideas and your approach critically. Um, People will give you feedback on that. It will inspire people. And they will also, in turn, feel more open about sharing that with you. Be open about your processes. A lot of game developers, um, when they're starting out, especially if they're starting out on small teams, there aren't established production pipelines. There aren't established production techniques. Many teams don't have a producer. And as I'm sure Julia will agree, producers are extremely important. <laughs> So talking about your processes on small teams is very helpful to people. Um, I know developers that have been working for years and they, they really haven't worked much with a producer, if at all, and they struggle because it's just so hard to get things done. Um, they do a lot of work, but they don't get things done. So critiquing, it's important to know that if people don't ask you for a critique, you probably shouldn't give it unless it's your job. But if people ask you for your opinion and your critique, do it in the genuine spirit of helpfulness. I've seen a lot of game developers that will gather around and watch a game. I've been guilty of this as well. Hopefully I don't do this anymore. And you basically just, for lack of a better term, shit talk about other games. Not very helpful, not very helpful to you. Even if you're critiquing among peers, um, if you're critiquing to the person, it's not helpful. So if you critique things in a genuine spirit of helpfulness, other people will be more likely to critique the work that you do in a genuine spirit of helpfulness and not just tearing it down or shit talking it. Um, please understand that game developers are all human. <laughs> we all need to live. Um, especially going through COVID, there's always going to be times where people, they need a break and they need help. They need physical help. They need psychological help. They need emotional help. They need monetary help. Um, Everybody's human, and even if you're not going through something right now, you will. Someday, you absolutely will. It's just a matter of time. And maybe what happens to you will be more severe or not so severe as the person who's going through it right now. But please understand that game developers are human beings and they need to live and not just work um, and try to take care of them. Watch out for the well-being of the people that you work with. Um, I think it's a very common trap for junior game developers. I fell into it to overwork and uh, we all overworked and no one around no one around said anything about it i didn't expect anyone to say any about it say, say anything about it but i do wish that more people had said you should go home <laughs> you should take some time off like this isn't optional like you you need to leave now um helping people to watch out for themselves and take care of themselves. Obviously everyone can make their own decisions, but especially if you're in a management position, you have a responsibility 
to watch out for these people and to help them. Um, don't just let them figure it out on their own because often it's a very painful lesson to learn that way. Support workers who need it. Um, you're all in this together. You're all working together. You're all gonna succeed together or fail together. Uh, it's not good enough for a couple of people to do well and everyone else to kind of have the floor drop out from under them as a project kind of goes on its way. So when you see people suffering, people who are not getting the support that they need, they're not getting reasonable work expectations, they're not getting compensated properly, uh, help them, uh, work to help them and represent them, uh, talk to them about what's going on and uh, they will appreciate it. And when, again, if you need it, then they will help you. And again, actively draw underrepresented people into this profession <laughs> and make them feel safe and welcome here. Um, it's an active process. They're not just gonna float in through osmosis or something else. You have to actually reach a handout, find them and welcome them in. If I had a clear answer for how to do that, I would tell you, I'm just saying I know it's hard because I've tried and it's difficult, but it's work that needs to be done and we gotta keep trying. That's it. So thank you very much. I really appreciate being given the opportunity to give this keynote. I do hope it has been helpful. Again, it's more broad than a lot of the talks that I give. Um, I hope that my experience has been somewhat illuminating to people who are looking to get into the industry or have just started in the industry. Um, I don't wanna discourage people from pursuing the things that they wanna do, but again, I hope my perspective is helpful. If you would like to email me, uh, you can email me directly at Obsidian. I do respond a little bit on Twitter, but I have a lot of followers that just kind of shit post with me, sorry. Uh, so maybe I won't respond there. My Tumblr is a little more useful for responding to questions. I like answering questions on Tumblr as well because the visibility of it goes up. So again, I really appreciate being given the opportunity to speak at DSTARS uh, and I wish you all a very great um, rest of your convention. Thank you.